And I also had a lot of people that I know message her and say, are you doing anything on mushroom extraction? I'm like, what? People are talking about that? That's crazy. <laughs> I had about 20 people apply to be speakers on this panel, and I present to you the people that the show vetted and chose. So I am really confident um, that this is going to be a worthwhile time. I'm going to talk as little as possible um, because nobody pays $5,000 a day for me to talk about extracting mushrooms. And that's not the case for these gentlemen. So I'd like for you to please introduce yourself. We'll just go right down the rail and then we're gonna go deep into SOPs and methods. What's up y'all, my name is Amir. I am the founder and CEO of a health optimization company called Specker. I'm also a product formulator and I have been working on product formulations with mushrooms over the last few years. Uh, mushroom products, mushroom cannabinoid blends, and just uh, getting ready for legalization. And it's gonna be a lot of fun. Thanks Amir. Marcus? So my name is Marcus Motes. My background's from Nature's Lab Extractions. Been around since 08. And then basically once we started uh, scaling up, we started using all our old equipment to try mushroom extractions. And uh, here we are today. Marcus, <laughs> <laughs> uh, My name is Ken White. Uh, I'm a chemist. Uh, my company's called White Scientific Consulting. And I've uh, been doing some development with the extraction and purification of all sorts of terpenes and synthesis. Okay. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Stone. I uh, own and operate Backcountry Cultures. We focus on scale media preparation and culture expansions. Uh, my college just by trade, chronic academic, I guess. Um, that's me. Um, oh, I'm so excited because if you guys knew what these guys knew that they want to share with you, it's like I want to get it out all at once, but we got to go a little at a time. Show of hands, um, how many people uh, know anything? Do you know something about extracting mushrooms? Raise your hands if you know anything. Ra raise your, I mean, <laughs> allegedly. Like, let's, you gotta, you gotta give me more, you guys. I wanna know, um, when I say mushroom extraction, what's a method that comes to mind? Does anybody? Cool extraction. Hot water and ethanol. Hot water and ethanol. So we got warm ETOH, anything else? Methanol. Methanol, what else do we have? Lemon tea. And you, a lemon tea, girlfriend, bring it, keeping it real. For, like, let's get some tea and lemon, and then you and I are gonna go sit in the purple podcast booth. I know this, this is a little high stress right now. I'll meet you there. Um, lemon tech, there's a reason that that works. They're gonna talk about that because acid base reactions is one I want to say, and I want to bring a sonicator into it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start with Ken. Ken, you're gonna just skeleton, bullet point, little bit SOP. And then these guys are going to interject where that's exactly what I do. This is what I do a little bit differently. And he's looking at me like I'm crazy. Do you know why? Because he charges a lot of money for this information. <laughs> I send them a little bit. Okay, he charges a reasonable amount of money, which is also a lot of money, which is reasonable for this information. And this was what I sent to them in the email before this. If you can imagine a question I'm going to ask in front of the audience and you're going to say, I know, but I'm not going to tell you, GTFO, don't be on my panel. We're bringing it. I'm not going to stop talking. Ken, <laughs> do the thing. Uh, so it really depends on what your final product usage, you know, what way you desire to use the, the psilocybin or psilocin in your final product. Uh, polar solvents are the way you want to go. People mentioned alcohols, people mentioned water. Um, if you do use water, you will have some degradation of psilocybin into psilocin because there's an enzymatic activity that's present in the fruiting bodies that converts some of the psilocin or psilocybin into psilocin, um, it particularly fair, with heat. Is it fair to draw a picture between THCA and THC in this regard? Like, can I not, just so that not okay. really? Not okay. <laughs> I remember when I said I was going to be quiet. It would be more of the metabolite of THC. Correct. Because when we talk about psilocybin, psilocybin. It'd be more like THCO. Yeah, THC, yeah. it's, it's a metabolite, it, the conversion of it. You guys knew where okay. I was going with that, didn't you? <laughs> Instead of heating it to activate it, your stomach's acid is activating it. So, in that sense, yeah, you're cleaving something, you're changing it a little bit, but those two are the active components that we're dealing with. 
Sure. That's, I guess that's where I was going. Yes. And, and to be fair, when you consume them, the active component that is actually giving you the psychedelic effect is psilocin, which is the dephosphorylated psilocybin. Hmm. And that's acid. Acid. And enzymes. And enzymes, and enzymes, and enzymes, enzymes yeah. which is why lemon tech helps, right? Isn't that why when you... Or it may stabilize some of the psilocin during your steeping in water for extraction or making tea or whatever. Okay. All right. So we are going to take, and this is where a lot of us coming from cannabis, everything in cannabis is on the outside. It's all about shaking it off, knocking it off, right? We're going to, we're going to make those trichomes cold. We're going to knock them off. We're going to gather them up. That's how we're going to do it with cannabis. And it's not that way, Marcus. No. In mushrooms, all the goodies are on the inside, right? It's a totally different modality. Speak to that. And you just got to break down the cell walls quite a bit more. I mean, and there's chitin, I mean, that's hard. Yeah, there's, there's more than one layer on this one. It's not just like cannabis where you can just break it off with just basic cold or, or something like that. You really actually have to, you know, either through heat, agitation, uh, ultrasonic, I think is kind of, to me, the best way that I've found to do it. So tell me about that. I mean, we've, we kind of had an ultrasonic uh, unit just kind of sitting there collecting dust from when we had to scale up in cannabis on that. So Probably because I sold it to you because I thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. No, it was, the, uh, we, they, yeah, we used the crap out of those things. Okay. Uh, homogenizers are great. Um, ultrasonic, a little better. And uh, it just really helps break down the cell wall. The only problem is, is it does create energy. And the more energy you create, the higher the heat gets, which does help break down the cell wall a little faster, but the you know double-edged sword on that one is it helps the degradation speed up a little bit too. So you know, there's always that that point that's that, that perfect soft you know sweet point that you can get to, but it's kind of taking a while to get there just based on we haven't had the right lab testing to go along with it. I mean, I just recently found lab testing recently to even test anything. So that's been our biggest gap on on issues of getting things to you know be the same every time and have a repeated process, plus strains, you know, that kind of has the bearing in there. The very true. Yeah, yeah, just like cannabis, there's a whole lot of strains of mushrooms and a whole lot of research that needs to be done to even know what each one of those holds as far as lesser molecules and things like that. I mean, what sort of equipment are you looking at in the extraction process? Are you also a warm ethanol guy? So I've been, me as a product formulator, I've been trying over the last few years to figure out what the best extraction method is for product formulation. I've tried the ethanol in the in the product formulations. It works really well, um, you know, compared to like hot extraction. My feeling that I get is kind of similar, um, but I think like I, you know we were talking about uh, isolates, Wolfgang earlier. Like I, I'm hoping that we can start going into that world a little more to get you know the product formulations on my side uh, to be a little more efficient as well or stronger as well. You know. Ken, what are the challenges of going to isolated? I mean, you know a lot about isolates. You know a lot about miners. You are a chemist, and I I had to remove all the pens from the table because it's a white tablecloth, and Ken will just start drawing hexagon and it just. Hexagons everywhere. He's done it on windows. He got up in the middle of a panel and turned around to a window and started drawing on the window. Yeah, oh, James was there. Ken, talk to me about the challenge of isolates um, in terms of this really delicate, these delicate molecules that degrade in air and light. Uh, again, it really depends on what type of product you're trying to make. So give me the different it, options. See, I don't it, even know what the options right, are. Sure. Yeah, what it seems to me have? like the majority of people that I speak with are trying to make a gummy, right? Easy to eat, it's fun, you know, Flintstone vitamins, whatever. Uh, in order to you know in that process you're typically heating up pectin or some other gelatin type compound. Um, in that instance it would be ideal to keep the psilocybin in that form and not broken down further into psilocin. Um, it'll be more heat resistant when you're doing these formulations. Because you don't want it to be previously degraded by heat before you expose it to more heat. Correct. Did you um, hear if that? If you're making a vapor Correct. product or like something that would be like vaporizable, you'd want it to be in the psilocin form, which... Because you wouldn't want it to be heat activated when you vaporize it? It is, yeah, easier to vapor, like vaporize in Easy. that form. Wolfgang, correct. So the, so the temp is like 400 compared to 900 of psilocybin. Okay. Yeah, it's just. Oh, so you can't vaporize psilocybin? Yeah, it would be ridiculously hard. Of course, it can. 
Uh, question about the guy. Are we fake? Saman's <laughs> like, whoa. Saman just checked in. Saman Rasani, welcome to the room. Are we vaporizing psilocybin right now? <laughs> Who got the cards? <laughs> <laughs> Who's got that card from the <laughs> I think if you're going to go that route, you're actually better off synthetically making it from readily available compounds, which I could also show you. Yes. <laughs> I mean, let's, pre let's pretend that alchemy is true. What would that look like? I mean, what compounds can you synthetic? Oh, yes, we, you're at the D8 CBD Expo. We're all into the synthetically derived uh, stuff. Most synthetic routes that are effective are starting with 4 acetoxy in the wool. Uh, what if, is there an English solid. word for that? <laughs> uh, that's an English word for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> is, is it a panel where we can kind of participate? It is. Oh, so uh, I, there's challenges in procuring an acquisition of 4 ac toxy DMT. No, that's, yes, the, D, the dial, the tritamine, yes, but not the endol. Ah, okay, gotcha. So it's like a, it's precursor to, oh, the, to the DMT. DMT. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, we speak the same I'll language. I'll that plays into something, and I'll have Ken's contact information for you after the panel. Um, yes, my friend. With regards to the similarity of the mix and the like, genre, right? Is there, is there some sort of that it's like the purified indole compound is better or worse than a holistic kind of compound? So, <laughs> I guess my mindset is that, particularly if we're talking extraction mushrooms here, um, it's not just the psychoactive compounds that can be beneficial to the trip. Uh, when you do some of these polar or solvent extractions, you not only get the psychoactive compounds, but you also get these beta-glucan compounds and, and mushroom sugars that, at least in my experience, anecdotally, you know, I don't have a ton of scientific data to support it, but <laughs> it seems, in my opinion, to like smooth out the trip or like make your like, yeah, I, I don't know how to explain it better than that. It's just it, it makes your body feel less uh, intense or less toxic during the come up. Are you saying the natural or synthetic? Uh, if you're naturally extracting it, right, you get right, some right. of these other compounds along with the psychoactive. Yeah. And, then the other, and I've noticed that with uh, cannabinoid extraction as well, if you use a biosynthesized cannabinoid versus the natural cannabinoid, I notice a very similar um, feeling. So, so there's something about biosynthetics that just don't give you the same feeling as the natural compound, even when I'm using isolates. So do you, have, you, have you noticed that when using a psilocybin isolate compared to a synthetic? Uh, I, I actually haven't personally consumed a synthetic a psilocybin or psilocybin. I've, anybody here? I've, I've definitely observed a, a significant difference between consuming uh, psilocin versus a uh, whole fruiting body, even when I made sure that the dosing that I was getting the same amount of psilocin from a whole fruiting body the, exactly what you're talking about, and I believe there's some data now on the flavonoids uh, that is not the terpenoids, but the flavonoids that are contributing to the ease of the trip and the drip. <laughs> which, is, which is ironic because the first thing everybody wants to get rid of is the flavor and the taste of the mushrooms, right? So we're going to, you know, mushrooms are going to teach us something, and it's just all going to be a matter of how fast we pick up on it, but they're going to teach us something. And some of these flavonoids are photosensitive, so it's amazing because if you take it during the daytime, they don't really put you down, but if you take it at nighttime, they almost have like a benzo-like Valium relaxing effect. So it's See, quite fascinating. this is somebody dedicated to the science right here. <laughs> Daytime, nighttime, taking the shrimp. I'm just an addict. <laughs> a confused scientist. For the community. But we know, we know that there's, that there's um, photosensitive things in there because they root, right? They turn blue. We cut that mushroom open, it's gonna change color. There is so much going on. And what does this conversation remind us of? reminds us of um, the entourage effect. Yeah. Like, do we remember when that whole conversation was coming up 12 years ago, 15 years ago, when we're talking about you guys, it's not all about getting T 
THC diamond shoot. Turns out it was all about getting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I was going. But uh, what entourage of, effect? One of the things I've noticed um, with mushrooms is uh, I've been able to induce a similar type of entourage effect um, with, say, like a psilocybin uh, mushroom and then a lion's mane mushroom, and then mixing those together in the same way that we would uh, use THC and CBD to create a slight entourage effect, and then you know adding other essential oils and those things uh, in there. Um, so I've definitely noticed a mushroom entourage effect as well. So Marcus, let's speak to that. Let's speak to this classification of fungi and how maybe, maybe psilocybin and psilocybin aren't the only things we're looking for. And there's mm -hmm. power in cordyceps and power in reishi. Let's, let's speak to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, we use chaga and cordyceps in a lot of things that we do just as good help. They help mobilize, or mobilize everything kind of up in your body as far as especially other mushrooms go. Um, and I mean, it's kind of been varied from strain to strain of things we've, you know, been working with. Obviously, like the ones that we mess with the most are like golden teachers and penis envies. They seem to be the two most common ones to get a hold of. Uh, and then again, there's so many strains like just based off or sub strains of those. Uh, but yeah, as far as using something that's like an adaptogen, it seems like other mushrooms like the, the chaga and cordyceps seem like they'd be well daytime and nighttime. Versus reishi, we typically use on a nighttime version. It's the same with lion's mane. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, it was, it was, it was honestly, it's a recommendation off somebody else, and Whoa. we tried it, and it really does improve sleep quality, and it seems like things like that would help out. I use it for cognitive. Really? Well, yeah. 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 I was using it in the daytime too for cognitive. Oh, that's so cool. So, yeah. Yeah. Same. Oh, same. 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 I, well, yeah. Same. I, I agree that there's been same. a lot of uh, you been, uh, <laughs> introducing uh, plankton, like spirulina, oh. in, in with microdoses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and tell me why. Uh, effects of uh, holisticness. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. It's, it's amazing. The pockets, so spirulina is a little bit similar to that of like charcoal, right? Activated charcoal. But the, the pockets that are in spirulina, uh, they end up meshing really well and end up making a matrix with some of the fungi and some of the products, the adaptogens. So it helps with not just the bioavailability, but it almost kind of gives you like a sustained release instead of just a big hit right away. Mm -hmm. So it bind, it's a binder, right? So you combine them and then you it slowly trickles in. So it's, we wild, don't know, okay. it's very anecdotal. And I'm, I mean, I test myself and dose other people all the time. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, anecdotal. Uh, with yeah, some time. So it's got evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, like, every time you? I see anecdotal, it's like, that means me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, what do you, what do you, tell me about the other mushrooms you're working with, and how, is the process similar across the board? Because these compounds are similar? Uh, I think in, in a lot of the other ones that these guys are referring to, lion's mane, cordyceps, reishi, turkey tail, all that stuff, um, you know, they don't have direct psychoactive components in them, but you know, like, like you were talking about, or wrote, they're all talking about compounding these things with psilocybin. I mean, you've got the cool thing about lion's mane is it cleans off the uh, your 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 receptor, right, the myelin sheath on your receptor, and therefore would potentially maybe allow for even better. Uh, communication or reactivity from that receptor during conduction. Everything. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's amazing. I, I think that there's as much potential in the extraction of those substances, maybe even more, um, because we, their risk is not associated. Um, there's so much potential in that, and, and we're all hearing about it. We're watching fantastic time. Have you guys noticed that this mushroom thing is happening fast? Mm -hmm. yeah. Happening fast. Yeah. Yeah. fast. So, you know, cannabis, and it feels like mushrooms are going like crazy. And you think about how cannabis grows. How long does it take to, how long does it take to grow a crop? Five months? Three months or so? Yeah. Oh, eight weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Right? How long does it take? flowering, you're talking about a sativa. I mean, yeah, to cure it. I asked them that. Okay, <laughs> this, okay. Yeah. A couple of months. A longer. See, <laughs> going somewhere here. How long does it take to fruit out of a tub? 30 days, 45 days, right? Not long. 
how long, how long does it take dependent. for an industry to go? You know, and you look at the shortened, I think there's something to it. That's a little uh, little You know, uh, as so far as, uh, I, I've been thinking about this too, as far as prohibition goes, it's a lot easier to maneuver with mushrooms as it is, than it is with cannabis. So I feel like the black market of the mushroom industry, or the psilocybin in particular, got to grow a lot more kind of low key than cannabis did because it smells. Everywhere you have it, it and smells. And it takes so. power, and it takes room, and it yeah, takes resources. Yeah. And I'm growing the same dollar amount of produce in a tub without any of the electrical overheads, the nutrients, anything else that's accessible. Talk to me about how you do these consultations in places where they don't have decriminalization or something like that. You've got a plan for that, Ken. Yeah, I would just say using, whether it's me showing you how, or you experimenting yourself, uh, Using some of these other widely available mushrooms as your like feedstock for experimenting, like cordyceps, uh, is a great way to practice and kind of get the feel mm -hmm. for how you know some of the, the resulting products that come from from this type of extraction. So I would recommend it. Ah. To go. Or if you're in a state where it's not legal, typically that's how I would show somebody the process. Is I'll take you through it with something that's readily available, and we're not going to get arrested for it. How's the stability? Um, the end of it all. For which comment? Well, if you don't let it be exposed to light, any temperature or air, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> 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 so take it in space. Right. Space would be ideal. It's yes. a, delicate, a delicate little flower is that molecule, and it doesn't, it doesn't want to hang out. It doesn't have to. Yeah, so, psilocybin or uh, various salt forms of psilocybin, whether it's succinate salt or humorant or whatever, is always going to have a little bit better stability to the psilocybin mo molecule on its own as a free base. Um, I don't, I'm not exactly sure why, but I believe there's some reactivity with the amine tail closing in and cell like, cyclizing and becoming an inactive compound. That's also my theory. There's a question about testing in the back. Um, with the different other different mushrooms, and you have cordyceps and cordyceps, aranaceum and lion's mane. Are you, when you're doing those extractions, do you have a lab that you can test for those? No one knows. We don't know what the actives are. Yeah, there's like one lab with uh, standards for lion's mane, and that's that's it. Like. They're not really. Either, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, we're just waiting on standards for from these labs, and yeah. then we can start submitting. I figure we're all down. So, so with something like lion's mane, you've got like four hercinones, as well as the beta glucans, as well as the polysaccharides, as well as the things that we don't even know. Right now. So, Always on downs. Yeah. Always. <laughs> Those are my favorites. <laughs> They're actually the best, usually. I mean, that's probably what's really doing. Back to the entourage effect, that's probably what's going on. It's exactly. Just, we don't know what they are. Which again is why I'm not necessarily encouraging people to, to shoot for this isolated compound. That right. you know, if you get a bit of a full spectrum, I uh, you know, full spectrum isolate, I guess, whatever you want to call it, free flowing powder from the fruiting bodies. It's more concentrated, easier to uh, formulate into whatever product you want, uh, but has better stability. It contains all of these other components that are beneficial. Uh, I've been co-crystallizing with the extracted sugars from the mushrooms, and that helps with the stability. Uh, Talk more, more, more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what does that mean? Uh, they're more stable. I, yeah. No. Uh, ooh, when you can lock it up in a structure like that, it's just like. And you do that by uh, vacuum desiccation. You can treat it like a slab. Okay. Yeah. So your extract, and and when you end up with that beautiful little amber chunk of crystal, uh -huh. when you end up with that, what sort of percentage of that recrystallized? Because I think people are going to be surprised. We have a guess. So when he showed me okay. yeah. this amber crystal, and he said this is the re, he said the thing. That okay, so total yields, um, if you're doing it by method, and it's kind of like a standardized way to get repeatable yields, it's 20 to 25 percent. I was um, going to have them guess. Yeah, it's 25, <laughs> 20 to 25 percent. Uh, total yield from the biomass, but the concentration of potency is usually three to four percent active. So. so, what we're calling crystallized mushroom extraction is three to four percent active. 
There are ways to up the potency though. Um, where we are dealing with like a sugar syrup, sugar syrup. So like you can do things like crash out ex excess sugars and stuff like that and up your potency. But we might up the potency and we might lower the efficacy. <coughs> Marcus, I mean how, how, we don't really know what we don't know yet. Yeah, I mean, until we get a decent amount of labs, at least more than you know one or two that we can actually take averages from and, and see who's you know got the tech down and who's just kind of throwing darts at a dartboard, uh, it'll make that a little easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll gladly sponsor HPLC and a few analytical equipment to uh, do testing for you guys. So I don't think you get any kind of argument for any of us on that one. <laughs> yeah, sure. And then, and then, and Where do we meet up at? And we can we. I house in Venice. This is my hus, LA. I'm, so, a, I'm working with a lab right now and gonna get the standards, so I'm gonna start. That's awesome. Let's test. build a library of all the shulgins and uh, Can we say it started right here at this panel? Here's what it is, you guys. They're not gonna bring it to us. Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna come. Sigma Aldrich isn't gonna knock on your door and say, hey guys. We have this whole full adaptogen and saccharides and nonsense other words that they said. <laughs> we have this all coming for you now. They're not going to come for us. Just like in cannabis, where we had to pull decent equipment into this market, where we had to drag industries kicking and screaming to come into cannabis, we are going to have to drag them into what's effectively becoming citizen science around mushrooms. Because we're going to do it. I'm gonna say what Propane Jane says, we do what we want. And we're gonna do this, like we're already doing it. So when we talk about citizen science, this is what it looks like, right? It's the practicing and it's the doing it and it's the getting it together and it's maybe we have to get a DEA license and create those standards, Ken. Can we go into business and do that? Let's do it. Okay, so we're going to do that too. And then I think in the meantime, you know, when you were saying uh, if it's illegal in the place that you're at, if you're consulting somebody, then you're going to give them some other option. Well, there are other people that will say, just do it. Just do it. If you get in trouble, you get in trouble. That other person might need me to. <laughs> I, have a space, I have a space where... Uh, Everything is legal within that space. I created all for personal use. Right? Um, it's for research purposes only. Yeah. You guys know that we are research crazy around here. <laughs> um, I we still have 15 minutes, and I fully plan on going over. I know you've got more questions. Who has a question too dumb to ask? Too uh, dumb to ask. When, when he was saying about the crystallization. And the three percent active. What's the other ninety-seven percent of? It's yes, more thing. Um, so it's widely <laughs> unknowns, but um, <laughs> the cool things. The cool things that we do know, it's going to be widely trailose, which is the mushroom sugar that gets directly um, extracted, and that's just because of the polarities. They're both polar compounds, so to, to separate the sugar from the, the salt, which is. Um, well, psilocybin so, or so, so, so it's going to be um, a little bit harder to separate those two. So just yeah. for ease of the process, we're keeping them together. Oh. And also for like ease of mind, you're already consuming these compounds anyway when you eat the yeah. mushroom. So, oh. <laughs> so it's like not being it's, it's, it's not artificial. Really. Really. Where we done the yeah, it, it, it's already from the mushroom. There's also a company up in the Bay Area that is extracting. Into an isolate, and then they're readulterating out with normal ph pharmaceutical fillers, things like tapioca powder and stuff. So it might just be better to go with a fully mycological extracted product to start with. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. I've been having that problem in product formulations with the oil and the waters. Um, may I jump in on this one? <laughs> your normal things that allow you to emulsify should work. Your VG, your um, lecithin, stuff like that. Without using work. bad ingredients like VG. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's a, but it's a water. Not spot spot. Spot. Yeah. 
hard for them. So really, it could be less important than that. So also fine. Uh, I'm working with a company that is. Uh, <laughs> it's it's drop the mic, not unplug the mic. <laughs> so um, so compound is water soluble. So um, I'm working with a company that does soft gels, um, and so what they're doing is they're suspending my concentrate in a PG solution and then injecting it into an oil-based soft gel. And so the when it sets up in the soft gel, it, it's good to go, and it, it's a non-gritty, completely dissolved soft gel. Good. I've got a question in the back. Um, what species of mushroom are the primary for, uh, for like both nature's questions, or et cetera, are you finding has better yields, or is there a difference in yield between the primary strain that people are seeing on the market right now? Definitely. Uh, for example, penis envy, I have a lot better luck with getting a lot higher yield off that. It just seems like there is more in there. Uh, golden teachers, though, on that on that side, is for those two general ones, I, I seem like I get a less less of a yield on it and a lot more extra stuff. The other thing I think that we're gonna see is we're able to do some outdoor cultivation. There are mushrooms outside the Cubensis family that have far higher concentrations of the psychoactive compounds in them that can be grown outside. I mean, they just they just want to be, be in horse shit in the ground outside. Like it's not, it's the wood chips and crap and you're in business, but we can't do that here because we're hiding in tubs in our closet, allegedly, right? Allegedly. So, so I think what we're gonna find, when we're able to really synthesize these compounds and be able to cultivate at scale like we should, um, I think we're gonna find that there's more, there are other, and not even strains, that's a different species. See, see, see. Yeah. That was an audience test, you guys did great. Um, even generous. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna find that there's better places. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hot, you guys. <laughs> it's it's hot. Um, we're gonna find that there's better places to cultivate psilocybin and psilocybin, I believe. You know, it was uh, Paul Stements, I believe, that said the strongest mushrooms he ever got was when he was a kid. It was behind, they were growing behind a police station. And they went and took all of them, and he's like, those are the strongest mushrooms that he ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't get caught. So. The police <laughs> station <laughs> mushrooms are always great. Being that from Arkansas, we definitely flipped a ton of cow patties. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, I'm right over here. Yeah, so I do have a question um, regarding the economics of mm. this mushroom uh, and some of the similarities or the parallels of cannabis, for example. When I saw it transfer from black market to shops and things like that, I didn't really see a change in price as a consumer. You know, you buy a, an eighth of cannabis from your dealer in the 70s, the price was similar, well maybe not the 70s, but you'll see similar similarities in price from black market to quasi-legitimate uh, distribution to consumers. How, rel what's the relative cost to for consumer versus cost of production when we're looking at these things like you know the the, the labs that you guys are using the extraction methods these are very expensive equipment is this going to make for the consumer side astronomical is it going to be like fifty dollars an eighth of mushrooms is going to be fifty dollars per concentrate like what what, what what can we expect as a consumer I, I actually think you're going to see the price drop Oh, yeah. no, no, because you're not buying mushrooms from some Joe who's <laughs> growing, you know, a couple totes in their closet. They have like a fifty thousand square foot warehouse, growing like a thousand pounds a day. Yeah, it's, yeah your, your space that you embody on this is a lot less. Uh, obviously, we're not using electricity. Um, the vessels you can pretty much make. You can buy a tote. You don't need to use necessarily crazy equipment that you would normally use. So yeah, I, I see the price driving down. The only variable being on that right now is lab testing. And it's just because there's not very many lab testing companies available. I'll immediately after this. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's 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 yeah. 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 We're it's working on a name still. What numbers is panel? So to, to um, answer that as well, um, what I notice right now with uh, cannabis to uh, psilocybin uh, pricing is it's about the same price right now, which is about $10 a gram, which is what I've noticed uh, on the street side and on the white market side of legal cannabis, about $10 a gram. Um, but as you guys are saying, I mean, the energy expenditure is so much less 
with growing mushrooms that the reason that, you know, what you were saying, we don't have lab tests, it's also way more prohibited. It's not as normalized in our society. We don't have mushroom dispensaries everywhere yet, you know. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot, and this is something that's important to say, and Ken is absolutely right. Unless you are in specifically Oakland, California, Denver, Colorado, even, even, I wouldn't even say Oregon. So Oregon, you know, decriminalized personal possession amounts, but you have a garage full of totes and some socks let distillation apparatus, lower methanol going on. It's bad because they increase the penalties on everything else except personal possession, you guys. I mean, that's the reason that the bill that was going through California to decriminalize, that's the reason we slowed that down, is that right at the end, you guys all follow that? That's so just, at the, just at the end of the last legislative session, um, they said, oh, and here's all the limits. You know what a limit is? A limit is a threshold for arrest. That's what a limit is. They're trying to do the same thing you know? they do with cannabis, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need to watch. And if you are not following decriminalization on Instagram in your local area, if you're not part of that, dog on it. What are the good resources? Are what are the good resources to follow? Decrim, I like Decrim yeah. California. I Decrim think they're the best. Has, yeah. you know, um, I like to watch what Matt's doing because I like to know what yeah, you're stickers. doing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but find your local decrim organization, and if you don't have a local mycology society, start one, join one, find somebody, join your local mycology society, get together with the community because it's going to be like mycelium, and we're going to be under all their feet, and then we're going to like be fruiting bodies, and it's going to be all over. But we have to be connected, right? Right now, we have to be connected so that we can really bring it up. Um, I want to let these guys each wrap it up with something important. I'm going to take another question. I have a question for you. It is, oh. and I'm ignorant to this, but yes. what on the decriminalized side or this law that just passed? It didn't pass. Are there? Oh, it didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Whoops. No, it was good that it didn't. But, but we, the, yeah. California has already decriminalized. Sure. With Prop 47 that passed years ago, that was the bill that really led the way for the psychedelics being decriminalized. And in places like Oakland, where it's decriminalized, People are still getting raided. They have like these churches and these little dispensary types. Like it, 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 it mimics what cannabis was like 25 years ago in California. <laughs> there's there's one church, okay. it's been raided once. That's the church, yeah. There's a pathway to get your felony reduced to a misdemeanor for possession. You're talking about Oakland. For California. For California, general. okay. Uh, and then it's okay. not a, it's truly not a decriminalization as much as it is a deprioritization so when the police when the law enforcement makes it their priority when they want to slap on sales when they want to slap on manufacturing things that are not covered in this language they will they will arrest you yeah. so does that answer there's, Ken, yeah. you were gonna ask? and Ken there's one more thing that we learned from Colorado that the state has to add verbiage in there that the city cannot put money towards prosecuting because what ended up happening was that even though it was decriminalized, it was up to the officer to determine if it's a deal or if it's for personal use. So there was a lot of discrimination that some people would have a gram and that's for deal. Some people would have a whole ounce. So they added, the, it's, that's what we need to happen in California to add the right verbiage. So that's the flip side of this uh, SB 519 limits. When I heard, you know, new approach pack, which just feels kind of awful and disgusting, but talking about the limits, if you don't define the limits, then cops can define the yeah. limits perhaps and just call it something else that's not covered like sales. In so adding they the, want to do that. So. so adding the verbiage in there that it's now decriminalized and the city cannot allocate any funds towards prosecuting, that basically gives us blanket coverage that, yeah, now they, they can't, they just can't. It's decriminalized. And please have a lawyer, okay? And just good mom advice. Uh, I have a dumb question, <laughs> sorry. Last <laughs> one. I have a question for you guys, sorry, last one, I'm hogging the space, I feel like. So, you just bought the HPLC, you have all the space. <laughs> We're friends now. We're partners. We're in business. <laughs> uh, 
I like the open source communication here, which I think is a, a significant pivot from cannabis, where everybody was holding it tight. Anyways, my question is, uh, when I'm testing for, you know, uh, Silly, right? I'm telling psilocybin, even biocystin, uh, psilocin, getting these standards. But when I'm so, so I can test what, how good some of these strains are, like, like the Amazonians. But when I'm sourcing the cordyceps, because I'm making a lot of these formulations as well with uh, chaga, all these, but there's no standards, right? So I'm having a hard time sourcing. Like if I'm getting a cordyceps that's worth more than its weight than gold from China, from silk, it actually, I can't even take more than 100 milligrams because of nitric oxide flush I got because it's that effective. Or I can go on Amazon and buy five pounds with it for $30 and it does nothing. So that's, I believe, is a hurdle we have to solve together in figuring out the sourcing and what. Well, and really, that's why we started this company with our new HPLC machine. <laughs> <laughs> so HPLC will be a one component of it. These that's are all one component of our new company. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want. I want. Um, I want everyone here and everyone who's watching on all the people that are live streaming to know precisely how to get in touch with you because they're gonna want to, because you guys are gonna be busy after this. And here's something else that I know. For every for every one of these guys that we're missing, um, Cameron Walker right now, who, who had an emergency surgery and should have been here. Oh. But if you call one of these guys and they say I'm uh, slammed, and but I've got a guy who knows it, I, I think you can trust them. These four you can trust. So if you need some consulting services, um, these are your guy. I, I just uh, want to thank them so much. Amir, I want to start with you. How can we be in touch with you? Uh, you can check me out on all social media platforms. Uh, my name is Amir Zendanam, at Amir Zendanam. If you could figure out how to spell that, it would be awesome. You might not be able to. Um, or you can check out my website for my company. It's speckerhealth.com. S P E K R health.com. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, also, I want to mention uh, what you were talking about with the cordyceps and sourcing all these other uh, different types of non psychoactive mushrooms. That's why I have not officially released a mushroom product into the market yet because I cannot figure out a perfect standard yet. And when I do, the products will be. And it's, it's a double edged sword because the reality is, as a consumer, right, we want, uh, there has to be a shift in the product. Yeah. Because as a consumer, if you go to McDonald's, for example, and you get a different fry every time, we're upset. But then we don't want the GMO <laughs> shit, right? So the meat is going to taste different from time to time. So you want uh, completely consistent boutique organic product. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can get that to me at uh, Nature's Lab Extracts. Um, it's uh, that's our Instagram too at Nature's underscore Lab underscore Extracts. Do you love or, how he says Nature's Labs Extract like it's just no big deal? Yeah. Okay. And then uh, or my email Marcus at Nature's Lab Extracts.com. Thank you, Marcus. No problem. Uh, the best way to get a hold of me is on Instagram. It's pretty much the only social platform I'm on. Uh, underscore Hashton, so like Hashton. Oh, you're Hashton. He's Hashton Pusher. We're Pusher. Hashton Pusher. I got a follower here, bro. Thank God I've got one. No, I'm uh, following. That's two. Okay. <laughs> uh, on Instagram, I'm Dinkelberg, D-I-N-K-L. B three R G, uh, and then you can just email me backcountrycultures at gmail.com. Um, Wolfgang is also really active on the Future Forty Two Hundred. Oh, there's, there's, <laughs> there's some great threads. There's some great threads for extracting mushrooms. There acid base reactions, SOPs that are being formulated on the fly. Any Future Forty Two Hundred fans in here? Uh, <laughs> yeah. okay. All right, gang, gang, guys. Um, gang, gang. One. One uh, it's just email backcountrycultures. Bat. What was your name? Dinkelberg. What? Dinkelberg. D-I-N-K-L-B-3-R-G. All right, you guys. Would you please thank my panel? They've been yeah.